welcome to everyone. Um, my name is Trini Li. I am the director of Taiwan Study Programs at University of Nottingham. Today is our honor to invite all of you to join us to join to this very, um, I would say, exciting book launch uh, of our book, A New Beginning or More of the Same, The European Union and East Asia After Brexit. It is a great pleasure to introduce all my colleagues in the book, which I worked with all these great scholars as the contributors of the chapters, and also uh, Dr. Michael Riley as a co-editor. And uh, to start with, actually, I would like to appreciate two institutes and two individuals. The institutes that finance this conference, at the, uh, I would say that in November 2018, sorry, 2019, was Taipei Representative Office in London and also the research committee of our school, School of Politics and International Relations of University of Nottingham. Their generous finance support, financial support made the conference and then consequently we have now this beautiful book. And certainly welcome all of you if you like to purchase, published by Paul Graff. And we literally only received this book a day ago. Uh, apart from this, what I would like to especially, uh, especially thank for two people, uh, Miss Ya Hui Chen from Len, she was working at the TRO in London, helped us a lot in terms of the initial organization of the conference and seeing through the process of the publication is another person that I would like to especially thank for, that's Dr. Mark Murphy. He helped us to work with all of the chapters, contributors in terms of the bettering our sentence and grammar and being patiently work with us. So it's my thank for all the all of your support, of course, the two institutes, and not to mention that all of our wonderful scholars in this book. I won't them all, and I learned that speak less will be better. So what I will introduce the book in terms of the content is to tell you all, what are the book not about? And our contributors will tell you, oh, what would be the book talking about? So what I'm saying now is the book is not talking about, it's not talking about Brexit, first of all, actually. Uh, we talked about this with uh, Michael and uh, the book is not about why the Brexit happened, how that emotional, junction started, it is not about that. We thought that is an important historical junction to, to use this kind of the event, no, event, but this historical junction to look into different area actors, USA, China, EU, UK, and Taiwan for sure. Before and after this historical junction, what would those uh, actors behave, interact with. And another thing is, this book is not just talking about trade and uh, uh, free trade agreements because there's most of people would link Brexit's impact with. We are more comprehensively to talk about different sectors. So for instance, the chapter contributed by Robin and Yu Qing is talking about the high tech uh, industries, uh, the impact to high tech, high tech industries in Taiwan. And also um, Susan's chapter will be talking about more about education sectors in a broader sense. And of course, it is not a handbook of different industries, but it is a book that we think that the Brexit would bring the consequence impact on different sectors. So high tech sector, education, and security for sure. Andrew and Corey's chapter, last but not least, is Michael give us a very good review of the trade. We're, we're not just talking about trade, we are talking more than trade. 
and FTA's uh, relations in the region. So I think my role here is just to serve you, like to tell you what this book is not talking about. And the rest will be our good contributor started by Professor Richard Higgles that his first chapter will set up the scene of what this book uh, kind of in a general, much, much more general term of the books about. So we are giving each contributors five minutes to introduce their chapters. Time is very short. All our contributors are fully prepared in order to interact with our audience more with the time at the QA. Our <coughs> recording will stop at the QA, so I should not delay further. Richard, please. OK, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Chun Li. Uh, very nice to see everybody. Uh, after all this time, uh, I'm sitting in Florence uh, and I've just come in off the terrace so as not to irritate you by uh, talking to you from the sunshine. Um, my opening comment is on the title of the book, there is no new beginning, but things are definitely not the same. If you remember, our workshop uh, took place pre-COVID. Uh, our workshop also took place prior to the arrival of a new commission uh, in, um, in Brussels, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, and a new uh, high representative for external relations, Josep Borrell, uh, and prior to Brexit. So I read my chapter this morning again for the first time seriously since I, since I wrote it. Uh, and what strikes me is that it and the other chapters in the book have actually stood the test of time much better uh, than I expected them to, given the events of the last uh, 12 to 18 months. Uh, so I think the themes that I identified in the book about the <laughs> difficulties of trying to manage a changing world order uh, have been confirmed rather than refuted in the last 18 months. And I say this notwithstanding a change of administration in Washington uh, either. Uh, I think the principal characteristic that I identified in the problems of, a revolving, of an evolving world order was the growing standoff between the US uh, and China uh, at the time. Now, I think while the rhetoric may change over the next few months, I think the, the nature of that relationship is going to remain largely unchanged. We are moving, I think, in the direction of what I've called in a recent paper for the London School of Economics towards a new binary, uh, not a multipolar world order, but a new binary global order. Uh, and my view on the role of Britain and Europe uh, in this new binary order is that they are in an extremely uncomfortable position. Now, many of you will know that the, uh, the European Union has tried to develop a new international relation, a new foreign policy strategy. Uh, this idea of strategic autonomy uh, that is being championed by Borrell, van der Leyen, uh, Macron, uh, and somewhat less enthusiastically, uh, Angela Merkel. But my judgment is that uh, this uh, new strategy for dealing with Asia on the one hand uh, and America on the other is flawed. Uh, it's going to be a hedging strategy uh, where uh, Europe hedges west on some things and east on others. Uh, and if I can use a not very delicate metaphor, uh, is likely to finish up like a dog between two trees. Uh, in terms of the the what are, which are, what are, well, the consistency the consistency of this strategy, so I think that that is that is a problem that I think is worth uh, thinking about. Uh, Britain, of course, has got its own problems. Unsurprisingly, breaks out Brexit is turning out to be more severe uh, in its impact than many of the the Brexiteers. Uh, believed it would, or perhaps they believed it would, but they didn't care anyway. Um, and so uh, Britain's attitude towards Asia is in some ways as confused as Europe's 
uh, I think, at the, the moment. Uh, if we look across the spectrum, the policy spectrum from attitudes towards Huawei uh, through to uh, expressed desires to join the RCTPP, uh, it, it strikes me as not a, a very well thought out strategy. So my last sentence, similarly to keep to my five minutes, is uh, it's not a new beginning, but there is a lot of change. Uh, it's plus a change, uh, really, I think is the, the expression. Uh, the principal characteristics that we identified are strengthening uh, rather than weakening. And the three characteristics I would, I would identify uh, are basically uh, the growing global binary between China uh, and uh, the US, the confused nature of European uh, policy towards uh, uh, East Asia, uh, and uh, the US and the equally confused and, uh, and difficult uh, policies that a post-Brexit Britain has. So I finished Chun Li, probably managed to uh, irritate everybody who's listening, but uh, that's fine. Thank you, Richard. Your um, uh, opening thing is great and uh, very well timed in five minutes manage to open such a thing. <laughs> so um, our next uh, chapter speaker will be Rod, please. You're muted, Rod. My apologies, everyone. That means I only have four minutes. Uh, I <laughs> no, was no, asked, no. You are fine. <laughs> I will uh, mute myself. I was asked to uh, uh, give a bit of historical context. Um, I'm not going to go into deep. I didn't go into deep historical context. I think I took uh, 2008 as my sort of start, starting point because I think it was an, an important uh change in, in the sort of uh, nature of the relationship. Uh, the global financial crisis uh, highlighted the weaknesses of the global system and the West, and particularly the Western financial system. It dealt a huge blow to the confidence of the West, and it marked, of course, the emergence of China uh, as a real global player uh, with ambitions of its own to prevent to present a a real alternative uh, to the Western rules-based order. Uh, the rise of China and the EU's response to it uh, have been obviously uh, important bilaterally, but also to the uh, EU's relationship to the rest of the uh, countries in the rest of the region. Uh, in my view, the EU's view of China has been slow to evolve, uh, and all this is played out against a back drop of uh, globalization, the rise of globalization, and the rise of discontent with globalization. So this is a very uh, complex historical background against which uh, these uh, trends have been evolving. Uh, the EU, I, I think, is still heavily influenced by its belief that commercial and political strategic relations can be separated out and dealt with uh, separately, particularly in the, in, in the case of China. I think partly this is because historically uh, China has not provided a, uh, a real uh, security or indeed political challenge uh, to Europe and the Europeans have been able therefore uh, to concentrate largely on uh, their developing their commercial uh, relationship. But I do think that they have been slow to uh, realize the uh, changing nature of the challenge that uh, China now presents uh, uh, both to the European Union itself and more widely. Um, on, in contrast, of course, the US does see things uh, very much more through a political lens uh, and a strategic lens. And this is um, uh, exacerbated, I think, the difference of views between the EU uh, and uh, 
the US on how to treat China. And of course, uh, it has been uh, highlighted uh, with the, these ideas of strategic independence. Uh, and it is very difficult, I think, for the European Union uh, to believe uh, that it should be perhaps thinking more seriously in terms of, of its relationship, as, as the previous speaker has, has pointed out, of its relationship both with China and the United States. And it needs to have a more strategic view uh, of, of this, a more strategic and long-term view. Uh, I think Europe in dealing with China has been uh, too easily seduced by uh, its rhetoric in, in promotion of values and human rights and these kind of things. And it does uh, pick up on uh, China's behavior in Xinjiang and in Hong Kong, for example. Uh, but it has really been unable to uh, translate that into a wider uh, political view of of China uh, and the kind of threat that it, it uh, threat or challenge that it uh, presents to us. With the other countries of East Asia, I think uh, Europe has been much more successful, uh, largely because there hasn't been that kind of political strategic uh, background or challenge to it. They have been able to uh, develop a network of free trade agreements and indeed other kinds of agreements uh, with uh, Japan and Korea. But of course, they've failed significantly uh, to do anything much in the political realm uh, with Taiwan. I think uh, really that the sort of long term challenge, again, as the previous speaker has said, is in managing an effective relationship uh, between uh, China uh, and uh, the United States. And my view of uh, the European Union's record in dealing with sensitive political issues such as uh, the embargo, such as the arms embargo, such as Huawei, uh, has not been very successful. I think it still finds it very difficult uh, to deal with China at, at, a, at a political level. Um, as far as Brexit is concerned, I would agree with the previous speaker. I don't think it is going to make a fundamental difference uh, to the way that these relationships are brought forward, but it will exacerbate uh, some of the existing trends. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Great to pave a historical background as we would like for your work in the book. And our next chapter contributor for our audience, uh, uh, chapter order and authors on, are on the meeting chat posted by our very capable intern Ben. So the next chapter that is certainly a very important actor, USA's perspective. Bob, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Jimmy. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, I'll make it fairly short. Uh, I think the the theme of my chapter uh, in the book was essentially that there is growing awareness and I think concerns about China's uh, strategic challenges uh, and threats in some ways, not only to the national interest of uh, both the US and some countries in EU, but also I think more fundamentally, more broadly to the uh, liberal international order that the U.S. and and the EU have you know, built up over the past 70 years. But the problem was that uh, it was very difficult to put together a cohesive response to these challenges, whether it's maritime claims of China, whether it's the state-driven economic model and the technology competition, or whether it's human rights, Xinjiang, that Rod and others talked about. It was very difficult to put together this this uh, cohesive response uh, between the U.S. and EU. And part of it, of course, was uh, probably attributable to the Trump administration's, uh, you might say, the, the America first policy, which brought a lot of problems into the uh, transatlantic relationship. But beyond that, I think just the differences in terms of within the EU itself, in terms of their national interests and their values and so on of the 27 countries. So. Uh, so I, I basically suggested that we, you know, we needed to think smaller. In other words, uh, go for coalitions, smaller coalitions uh, of, you might say, like-minded countries that 
can that do have mutual interests on specific issues and can work together on those, whether it's uh, maritime issues, for example, with uh, the UK and France, or that have the historic presence in the Western Pacific, uh, or technology issues with uh, the, the more advanced technology countries uh, in Europe and so on. So you have to look for smaller coalitions uh, to try to deal with this. Uh, having said that now, I'd like to just move on to the Biden administration, which I think is, uh, for me, uh, uh, sort of an optimistic uh, movement in the sense that it's kept the focus on China, first of all. Um, it's, uh, you know, obviously it's kept the a number of the policies in the past that Trump had in terms of trade, uh, naval deployments in the uh, Western Pacific, for example, the USS Nimitz, the aircraft carrier has now moved to the uh, to the Western Pacific. So it's kept a focus on on China's challenge. And I think that's very important. But even more importantly, I think the um, the Biden administration has uh, increased the focus on human rights issues. For example, now applying to rejoin uh, the Human Rights Council, the UN Human Rights Council in 20 uh, next year. And um, and finally, I think uh, most importantly, it's now again trying to go back out and reach out to uh, EU and European countries. Uh, this was expressed very ex uh, explicitly by President Biden at the Munich Security Conference. And of course, that's just the beginning. It doesn't mean all of these differences will be settled uh, in terms of the issues between EU and the US. But nonetheless, I think clearly, uh, I think the US intent is to work with our allies, in particular the EU, on the China challenge. So I'm quite encouraged by that. But obviously, there's still going to be a lot of work to be done ahead because the, the challenges that China poses uh, in all of these different areas, security, economic model, technology, human rights, and so on, are going to be very difficult. So I would say not more of the same, but I think uh, there's still going to be a lot of uh, work to be done in, in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Although a lot of work seems to have more of a positive uh, future awaits for us, looks like. Hope yeah. for the best. Okay, thank you, Bob. Then let's move to the next chapter, which certainly that is about UK China. So, Tim, please speak from Hong Kong. Thanks very much, uh, Junyi, for organizing this. Um, as you say, my chapter looks at uh, UK-China relations, and in particular, it traces the development of Britain's China policy from the Brexit <laughs> referendum in June 2016 to the formal departure from the EU at the end of January 2020. And I title it Imagining Brexit because throughout that period, the eventual shape of Brexit was rather unclear. Perhaps it's still rather unclear, but maybe a little bit clearer than it was during that period. From uh, 2016 onwards, the UK's future relationship with China was quite a frequent question for discussion in these sort of imaginings or visions of a future global Britain after Brexit. Um, and I, I conclude in the chapter, though, that policy towards China during this period was not shaped so much by Brexit or ideas about the UK's future strategic posture as by responses to developments in China and the way they were reported and discussed and perceived in the UK. And to bring out the, the importance of perception in foreign policy making, I use a framework from Scott Brown's 2018 book on EU and US policy towards China, which looks at threat opportunity perceptions across different areas of policy making. So the chapter identifies three phases in the evolution of the UK's policy towards are really in the direction of a more cautious and critical approach to China over that period. In the immediate period after the referendum, the general tenor of policy statements on China emphasized opportunity, and the government was anyway giving generally upbeat messages about post-Brexit Britain. But it's worth noting that although there was some discussion, including particularly in China, about some sort of UK trade deal, this was only ever obliquely referred to in official government statements. From late 2017, a second phase saw a shifting balance between perceptions of threat and opportunity, uh, apparent, for example, in Theresa May's early 2018 visit to China, when messages about opportunities for cooperation were balanced by caution over the Belt and Road Initiative. 
Then into 2019, China policy became more contested uh, with a growing influence of critical voices in relation to national infrastructure, Huawei, the South China Sea, uh, developments in Xinjiang and subsequently in Hong Kong. So that's what the chapter does, and I hope it will provide a useful historical account of the changes in British policy towards China during that period. The perceptions framework is also a useful one for analysing policy on an ongoing basis. And of course, through 2020, we saw much bigger shifts in the UK's policy towards China. There seemed to me to be a number of arguments as to why this was the case, and I'm not going to adjudicate these arguments. I think they all have some validity to them. The first one is that it was simply a response to developments in China, um, especially uh, reaction to reports from Hong Kong and Xinjiang. Uh, of course, COVID-19 and the discussion about China's role in that played a, a prominent role in the first half of 2020. And actually, Google Trends search results show a huge spike in searches on China in the UK during those few months. Another view says that this shift in policy was a sort of realisation of an earlier naivety about China. Um, another argument is the sort of pendulum swing argument that this was a rebalance from the perceived excesses of the golden era, uh, but doesn't necessarily represent the end of policy history. And perhaps it's worth commenting here that the UK's policy towards China has oscillated backwards and forwards over the last decade, much more than that of the European Union, for example. Um, another argument is about bureaucratic politics, that we've seen the weakening of voices for economic cooperation, previously led by the Treasury, perhaps some different personal views of ministers, and a strengthening of the security establishment voice in policy making processes. Finally, there's the influence of lobby groups, uh, reflecting perhaps some of those interests and responding to uh, developments uh, in China and how they impact on the West. In short, maybe policy has been captured by those who make the most noise. We've also seen a negative turn in public perceptions of China, very clear in a number of surveys over the last year. And this raises important questions for future research on British policy towards China. Uh, we need to understand how these perceptions are formed and what impact they will have on future policy towards China. So in conclusion, I think uh, there's plenty of avenues for future research and uh, I hope we have the opportunity to produce another book sometime soon. Thank you, Jeannie. We will. Just to compensate uh, the e-book launch, we need to have a physical book launch by producing another book. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Um, we then move on to original gens, Japan. What's the view or perspective of Japan of seeing, uh, witnessing all these changes beyond the region from David's perspective? If David could share your insight with us, please. Thank you very much, uh, Junyi. And firstly, thanks to you and to Michael for organizing the conference and the book and this book launch. Um, my paper on Japan's attitude to Brexit has been slightly uh, uh, overtaken, I think, by events uh, since the conference, and history has moved on a little. I record in the paper the extreme concern of the Japanese government and Japanese corporate world about the implications of Brexit from the time of the 2016 referendum through the Japanese government's paper, late 2016, calling for the maintenance of clear and frictionless trade between Britain and Europe, which was, of course, the basis on which Japanese companies in their uh, hundreds, indeed well over a thousand, had invested in the UK since the 1970s and Britain's original membership of the then European Economic Community. Uh, we've since seen the agreement between the two governments on the uh, free trade um, uh, arrangement, uh, which was announced uh, by the Minister for International Trade, Liz Truss, and her Japanese counterpart last October, uh, which rolls over to a degree and adds a few things around the margins, uh, the EU-Japan uh, free trade arrangement of some years previously. We've seen the British and Japanese governments reaffirm the importance of the strategic partnership between uh, Britain and Japan, uh, which has been enshrined in formal declarations by successive um, prime ministers uh, over the years, uh, both in terms of pros supporting prosperity and also in terms of supporting 
se uh, security, working more closely together in the latter field particularly. And we've seen the British government announce its interest in joining the CPTPP, uh, the Comprehensive and Progressive um, Agreement for a Trans-Pacific Partnership, the free trade arrangement in the Asia-Pacific region from which Donald Trump withdrew the United States in 2016. This is an important objective of the Japanese government and the British government are giving full support to the Japan's geopolitical aspirations. So the mood music between the two uh, governments is, is strong. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, there is also positive mood music in the corporate sector, uh, most recently with Nissan uh, affirming their continued intention of investing in their Sunderland plant. This is very much in influenced uh, by uh, the British government's commitment to aggressive uh, uh, carbon emission reductions targets and the phasing out of, <coughs> of diesel uh, by 2030. Um, Nissan are going to put a lot of investment uh, into Sunderland, which is by far their most productive plant in their, in their, um, in their industrial universe, uh, in order to take advantage of that. All of that is, is positive, and it reflects the Japanese uh, pragmatism on both government and corporate side uh, about adapting to situations which they found profoundly um, uh, uh, problematical because there was grave concern about the implications of Brexit from the referendum, but which uh, they want to adapt to uh, uh, as pragmatically as possible. But the proof of the pudding <coughs> is in the eating here. And ultimately, what will make this relationship work post Brexit will be the effectiveness of the UK's trade and industrial uh, and investment relations with the EU. And on that, the Japanese, as I imagine most trading partners, will look extremely closely at how the agreement which was reached at the 11th hour just before Christmas between the UK and the EU works in practice. Um, there's a lot of talk in the British press at the moment about teething problems um, uh, for specific exporters. Uh, and the assumption appears to be that once these are resolved, the relationship will settle down. The reality is surely that the the, the, the nightmare that was Brexit for a, a large number uh, of people in, in politics and industry will continue over the next few years. Uh, and that we will see, as one commentator has already called it, Brexit forever. And by that I mean um, Brexit in the sense of uh, Britain adapting to a, the new world outside the EU and having to decide just how far it wishes to diverge from EU regulations and standards, just how far it wants to uh, uh, adjust its own financial uh, sector in order to attract investment from abroad and the dangers of cross retaliation um, by the EU if that involves serious regulatory divergence. Similarly, the danger of cross retaliation from the UK if the EU moves in a direction that the UK finds unwelcoming. Uh, and the inevitability with 19 committees under the partnership arrangement having to review how the nuts and bolts of the relationship work, um, that we will be um, entangled in continued political argument over the implications of Brexit for the foreseeable future, and certainly up to the agreed uh, review of the current arrangements and the current derogations, which will take place in, I think, three years time. So this is not a political argument which is going to disappear, uh, nor in some respects is it going to get less complicated in political terms. And Japan will watch that um, and will want to adapt its policies in the light of uh, what the, the developing relationship between the EUK and the EU indicate to them. It's positive uh, that the two governments have been as pragmatic and as energetic as they have been uh, in, in uh, reaffirming the importance of the relationship. And as some previous speakers have already indicated, the change of mood, the radical change of mood in the international community on China plays very much into the strength of the UK-Japan relationship for geopolitical reasons. So that I hope is a, a, a helpful gloss on the now I think rather historical paper that I've contributed to the book. Well, it's always our um, dilemma that when we were working on this conference um, was at the point of whether it would be 
in the future or in the past. But uh, I think we, we just need to capture what we have witnessed and uh, your insight, David, from the ov observant perspective of Japan, which is very helpful and also very constructive for the overall book projects. I mean, Japan is the regional giant, in a sense, looking at China and uh, being very pragmatic, as you said, dealing with Japan's perspective interaction with the UK and the EU as a whole. So we, we look forward for more of your thoughts in our coming project and book. That's what I would hope. Thank you, David. Um, then we move on to a very, uh, also very important chapter, which is a joint chapter uh, in terms of the uh, securities perspective uh, from Corey and Andrew. They are both best in uh, Taiwan. So um, that's the, a very um, important perspective brought up by Len from Taiwan's perspective of the impact or consequence, or if I borrow what David just said, Brexit forever. So that's kind of a lingering um, impact in the region, but in the section or in the field, not section, sorry, in the field of security. So uh, Corey and Andrew, the time is yours, please. All right. So um, I'll start, I'm going to be very quick because I'm going to hand it over to Andrew, I think, um, because Andrew's worked in the administration and with the administration and other stakeholders, I think a lot of people would be interested in what he has to say. So just very quickly, what I've done is is basically we've looked to measure two things. One is the, um, the impact of Brexit on the reduction of Europe's soft power. Europe, of course, now says that it's a rival of, of China. So, so that's a thing that would be a negative for Taiwan. Um, on the positive side, we've looked at Brexit the post-Brexit global Britain vision, the, the, the moving east of this was that that notion that Britain may be contributing to arresting the shift in the balance of power in the Western Pacific um, as America shifts from a global hegemon, uh, a hegemon in the region to a the head of an alliance, an alliance head. Um, so we've looked at how those two things measure up against each other. There are obviously other considerations um, and the situation is still evolving. We're not quite sure what Britain's going to do, um, how far it will go. Um, so this contributes to the conversation rather than providing a concrete answer. Um, so I, I do have a perspective and an argument, um, but but yeah, it's, it's intended to be a con contribution to that, that conversation, um, which will probably be going on for a couple more years now. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll hand the microphone over to Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Well, to begin with, I want to thank my co-host, uh, Corey, to make a great effort to improve the, uh, the chapter. Uh, and uh, as a result, um, he has published. Equally, I want to thank uh, Tony and Michael uh, taking a, a lot of um, efforts and spend a lot of time to make this uh, book uh, possible and very successful. I want to say hello to uh, Ya Hui. Um, she helped me a lot for the past few years in terms of making necessary arrangements to assist my uh, trip to UK and meeting uh, all the scholars and the friends there. Uh, thank you, Ya Hui, for your great uh, efforts. Well, uh, since Choi invited me to, to focus on the Taiwan security, uh, I want to take the opportunity to uh, inform the audience what really happened uh, in terms of uh, looking at the peace and stability uh, in the Taiwan trade area. Fundamentally, uh, I want to encourage um, uh, audience to pay attention to the nature and the origin of the cross-strait relations. It is essentially and fundamentally unstable to begin with as a result of uh, political polarization between two sides of the Taiwan Strait. Um, and it has, it has been heavily affected by um, 
uh, you know, different political intentions. Beijing has uh, its own uh, political intentions towards Taiwan. Equally, Taiwan has its own political agenda over the years. So I took the opportunity to explain why uh, the uh, the Taiwan Street security situation is essentially and has been is essentially unstable and constantly being affected by misunderstanding and miscalculation from either side. Uh, so that is a source of um, uh, the challenges and difficulties of trying to create or maintain so-called status quo in order to uh, relatively uh, keeping peace and stability in the Taiwan Street area. So I try to bring the audience to take a voyage over the decades, starting from the Jiang Jingguo and Jiang Jie's era, and moving on towards uh, uh, Li Denghui's, uh, President Li Denghui's era, and then Mind Jiu era, and present Taiwan era until uh, today. So you can see, as a result of um, you know the nature of instability in the Taiwan Street area, so security and peace is constantly under the threat. Uh, as a result of um, conducting different kind of political uh, interests across the street, so throughout the years, we have witnessed different. Uh, uh, military escalations or tension escalations emerging in the Taiwan Street area. For example, in the 50s, we have uh, many uh, uh, military disputes and confrontations taking place in the Taiwan Street area. And throughout the 60s and 70s, and even under President Lee Deng Hui's era, we also witnessed a missile crisis taking place. Uh, between 1995 and 1986. So that is to say, um, we should pay attention to um, status quo is not a constant uh, phenomena in the Taiwan Street area. Instability, miscalculation, and misunderstanding probably are the constant phenomena uh, in terms of looking at the security situation in the Taiwan Strait. So I just want to uh, raise some examples. Even today, you can see uh, tension escalation has been greatly emerged in the Taiwan Strait area as a result of uh, increasing Chinese uh, military uh, activities conducted starting from 2020, even will continue this year and throughout the years. So that has become uh, the source of tension, instability, and security challenges. And over the years, I mean, especially last year and this year, this issue has been constantly uh, paid attention to and addressed not only by the United States, but by the entire region, but also including EU and UK as well. So. I just want to say this is the good time for raising the issue and bring about a much greater attention throughout the world. And of course, Taiwan is a major uh, contributor to uh, stabilize economic security and human security. I think Taiwan has made a lot of benefits to uh, make contribution to the world security. So I try to bring the this issue to alert a lot of people, particularly EU and, and Britain, to pay attention to this emerging uh, unstable factors, not only challenging Taiwanese security, but also challenging your security as well. So you have to adopt a different kind of approach and come up with a more in innovative thinking to deal with this kind of a common security challenges so that everybody can actually living in a more peaceful environment. I try to stop here and uh, hopefully, um, you know, we'll receive uh, some other uh, questions and response later on. Thank you. 
Thank you, Andrew and Corey, for the securities perspective. Um, well, if we're talking about innovative thinking, we are now moving towards innovation sector. So technology, supply chain, and uh, Taiwan in semiconductor after Brexit. Um, Robin and uh, Yu Jing, your time, please. Excellent time, Robin Klingler, Vidran. I'll go first and then I'll hand over to the brilliant Yu Ching. Um, so thanks you um, to Chen Yi and Michael for leading us in this book project and for giving us the opportunity to participate and contribute to it. And Yahweh, it's really nice to see you on the line today. I seeing your face was reminded that I have you to thank for being part of this altogether because you introduced me uh, to Chen Yi years ago. Uh, so on our chapter on semiconductors, pound for pound, Taiwan is the most important place in the world. This is a Wall Street Journal headline from late last year, and it resonated so much with what Chenyi and I are looking at in this chapter that we thought we would start with it. So why is Taiwan the most important place in the world on a pound for pound basis? Well, semiconductors. Semiconductors are central to innovation, which is increasingly the crux of glo the global economy and also the security arena. So some linkages with other chapters that you've heard about. Now, it's worth saying that semiconductors are including silicon, for which Silicon Valley uh, has gotten its name, are the materials that conduct currents, which are essential to electronic circuits. They power everything in our daily life, uh, so from computers, uh, that's powering teams on our smartphones or computers, um, appliances, cars, spacecraft, and, and more. Um, and as important as semiconductors are to the economy and to security, they are equally as internationally produced. So supply chains are extraordinarily global and individual parts are so complex that it is nearly impossible to replace any portion of the supply chain overnight. So the introduction of so much uncertainty into the international economy uh, means potential havoc or opportunity uh, in the realm of semiconductors. Now you may be thinking, where does Taiwan fit in? And if you know the Taiwanese economy, you'll know exactly where we're going with this, but it's worth saying that Taiwan is a global giant in semiconductors. The, the national giants in terms of countries are the US, China, Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan. Um, Taiwan is a crucial manufacturer, particularly in the foundry segment. Uh, so the production of the semiconductors uh, with you know, being this massive player where the uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Corporation, so TSMC, for instance, constitutes 48% alone of the global sector. Uh, so Taiwan is massively important to the global semiconductor realm and relatedly, semiconductors uh, constitute upwards of a third of exports coming out of Taiwan. So very important to Taiwan and Taiwan, very important to the world. And so this this very important industry is sitting in the crux of the US-China trade war and Brexit as well. And one of the things that I'm going to hand over to Yu Ching now, but one of the things that our chapter does that's unique is that we look at how the how Brexit and European relations with Taiwan uh, are affected by everything that's going on. And typically research to date has focused on US-Taiwan relations and vis-a-vis -vis China. So as Richard had said in the opening, a different version of hedging uh, is our focus. But uh, I hand over to Yu Ching now who picks up on the impact of Brexit and the US-China trade war on Taiwan in the semiconductor industry. Robin, yes, I, I was also very grateful to Yahui that I would be able to know you and then Yu Ting. Hi so, everyone. Um, yes, Yu Ting, please. First of all, I want to thank Chong Yi and Michael um, for uh, making this book possible and many congratulations to everyone. Um, Robin uh, spot, well spotted uh, the importance of Taiwan Semiconductor uh, very early on uh, uh, in the uh, between uh, the, the trade in the in the middle of uh, uh, U.S. and uh, China's trade war, and in our chapter we highlight a few things. Uh, it's a long chapter, so I just uh, 
point out a few things we have been highlighted in the chapter. First of all, uh, time, uh, UK as a as a separate country and European Union as a group has been a long term and a very, uh, top five uh, trade partner of Taiwan. So. Uh, the, keeping the trade relationship between uh, Taiwan and, and uh, UK and Taiwan and uh, U, uh, European Union are very important to Taiwan's economy. And Taiwan has been, uh, we uh, highlight, um, Taiwan has been caught in the middle of uh, the trade war between China and, uh, and US. Some, many uh, uh, commentators have been saying Taiwan's uh, semiconductor especially has been benefited a lot from this trade war, but they have like uh, we discussed this uh, by say, by highlighting, um, yes, probably uh, to some element this is uh, this is true, but uh, some they have they have ignored another picture, which is Taiwan. Uh, many uh, Taiwanese um, uh, businessmen has uh, set up their uh, factory in mainland China. They are forced to come back to Taiwan or relocate in uh, other. Uh, 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 Southeast and Asian country, for example, uh, India or Hi uh, Thailand or Vietnam. And um, um, we also highlight uh, Taiwan has long history with many European countries, uh, for example, in with Netherlands. Um, Holland, uh, uh, Philips in, uh, based in Holland has been a long-term partner of uh, one of our uh, biggest uh, semiconductor company, Taiwan Manufacturing uh, Semiconductor Company. And also, uh, for example, Osmo uh, has been uh, heavily invested in Taiwan. They, uh, they even set up uh, some initiative to train uh, Taiwan's semiconductor talent uh, to be uh, able to contribute to both Taiwan's uh, uh, in the, this uh, Taiwan's industry and also uh, Europeans uh, industry and uh, we, we 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 close this uh, chapter by saying we have been uh, uh, we have a lot of concern about Taiwan's future in terms of uh, uh, trade deal with uh, uh, with UK with uh, with uh, European Union but um, I think uh, in, in 2015, Taiwan has been trying to sign this agreement, uh, have been have a uh, trade war with uh, uh, European Union, but they, uh, there is no continuity, there is no uh, insurance of or con uh, continuity in terms of this trade talk. And Taiwan, yeah, uh, around 2018, a group of uh, uh, MP uh, come to Taiwan to visit uh, our president and they in in their discussion they uh, in, during their uh, meeting they have been talking about possible trade agreement between Taiwan and UK but there is no further sign uh, to come to be confirmed and Taiwan uh, we you know as we say we try to also highlight in our what we also try to highlight in our chapter is the we uh, we talk about the dislocation of the global integra integrated uh, semiconductor in, uh, chain. Uh, this has been, this pattern has been broken uh, since the trade war uh, happened. So we had a, a lot of discussion about this and, and Robin and I have been, because although our uh, chapter closed at this point, but as everyone knows, uh, the trade war still continue and the negotiation between uh, UK and and Taiwan and Taiwan's negotiation in terms of the trade deal still going on with the, the uh, European country. Um, so we still look at this as a uh, possible future uh, research for me and, and Robin. So we are still doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both, Robin and Yu Jing, that the, uh, certainly the high tech sector semiconductor is lead sectors that we're looking at the continuous development. Uh, with that in mind, actually a sector involve us all is education sector. So we thought to invite Susan to give us her perspective on the impact of Brexit on the education market, if I may say so. So Susan, please. Uh, hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So. 
Um, yes, um, it's not new for higher education provider, particular for the US, UK, Australia, and Canada. East Asia is an important market for higher education sector, especially in student recruitment and uh, transnational education activities, such as international campuses in East Asia, franchise programs, joint program, and so on. Uh, just give you an example, the number of students from East Asian country continue to grow and has been roughly the same as the number of students from the EU. Uh, the, student, uh, the number of students from East Asian country was more than uh, students from the EU in 2018 and 19, and most of them are from People's Republic of China. Moreover, East, East Asian students pay more than double for their tuition fee in compare with UK and EU students. Since the Brexit referendum in uh, June 2016, the UK government has been developing and introducing policies in preparation for leaving the EU. These policies appear to exclusively concern UK universities' involvement with the EU, its member state and its market. The question here I would like to address in this chapter is that what effect, if any, Brexit would have on the relationship of UK university with East Asia. This chapter is trying to assess the potential impact of Brexit on the relations of UK universities with the People's Republic of China, including Hong Kong, Macau, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. This chapter, this chapter we're also focusing on four uh, uh, areas. The first one is students' recruitment and students' and staff mobility, research funding, recognition of quali uh, qualification, transnational education activity. These impact areas are chosen because of their importance to UK universities. To assess these four impact areas in this chapter, I have a look at the policy that UK government has set out before the UK government and EU reach an agreement on the 24th of December last year, such as immigration policy, international education strategy, international research and uh, innovation strategy. These policy aim to boost the uh, uh, UK's education export and to facilitate UK university and research and innovation organizations, international partnership and collaboration to attract international researchers and so on. Uh, in this paper, I would, uh, I would, I, I won't have an opportunity to look at the Turing scheme and uh, the EU uh, UK Trade Cooperation Agreement, which was only uh, reached uh, last December, to, uh, um, the last December, yeah. And apart from the UK po uh, policy that might affect this impact area I mentioned, uh, we also have to bear in mind that UK universities' funding structure has undergone a sig a significant changes in the past decades. While UK universities' income from research grant, contract, and other income was broadly maintained and grew by 1.5% in the past decade, UK university has become heavily dependent on tuition fees and education contract. In this chapter, details on how the level how the level of impact of Brexit on those four impact area for UK universities relation with East Asian country are evaluated. Factors behind these impact have been identified as much as I could by, uh, by observing the policy and act activity in higher education in, in East Asian country. You will see a lot of examples uh, being drawn out in each impact area I, 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 I highlighted. Finally, I think UK universities' relation with East Asia have been influenced by more general economic, social, political and cultural factor in the East Asian region. And UK's government's relationship with, with this East Asian country. UK government and university will not only have to work harder to understand the higher education market um, in East Asia, which is already very competitive, but also to explore opportunities and to identify and respond to challenges as, as uh, COVID-19, uh, trade war between US and China, local regulation, national security, intellectual property, and academic freedom. 
Brexit could also open up opportunity for UK university to further adjust their services and uh, competitiveness, which will also benefit UK student academic researchers in if UK university are willing to work with the higher education sector in East Asia. And so far, um, I have been working in this job in the uh, University of Bedfordshire. I have not seen it happening. Um, that they are not trying to understand the higher education in 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 uh, East Asia, but only think about how to profit from it. Anyway, um, thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to hear your comment and co uh, or question at the Q and A section later. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I think uh, what your observation is not unique. Uh, <laughs> many of our colleagues can echo to that from the UK based universities so but that's the reason why I thought it's important to include education chapter okay so now we are heading to the conclusive chapter and as I said at the very beginning that this book is just not about trade but trade is the important thing and uh, I'm very happy that my good friend and colleague Michael he's working with us throughout and uh, this is, I think, very good moment for him to not only to speak up on his chapter, but also make a bit of a conclusive remarks of the project as a whole. Michael, please. Uh, thank you, Chini. Um, I think concluding rather than conclusive, I think the conclusive bit, uh, a lot more work needs to be done. My chapter follows on to some extent from what David Warren had said about the Japanese government's response in chapter six. Uh, three premises underpin uh, my analysis. Firstly, irrespective of Brexit, progress on new multilateral trade agreements has been in bulk now for actually many years, and multilateral agreements have steadily been overtaken by regional agreements or even bilateral ones. Secondly, although we've seen a lot of the people who are arguing that we should leave, that the UK should leave the EU, arguing as part of that that the UK is a great free trading nation, that trade is in our DNA, comments like this. This is actually something of a misunderstanding. Foreign direct investment relative to other countries, foreign direct investment is actually more important to the UK than is trade. And in addition, the, largely these same people and the desire to negotiate new bilateral trade agreements, they're also showing little understanding of the complexities of modern trade, particularly the importance of global value chains or supply chains in manufacturing. And one of the consequences of these is that bilateral free trade agreements are having to create their own bureaucracy to deal with the complexities uh, arising from them, sometimes called the noodle bowl effect. And this means that the supposed benefits of bilateral agreements often in practice go unrealized, especially for small companies, because the bureaucracy involved in complying just doesn't make them worth their effort. We're already seeing some anecdotal evidence of this in the UK post Brexit. In the chapter, I cite the cases of the China-Taiwan Free Trade Agreement and the Switzerland-China Free Trade Agreement, where there's been much more extensive academic analysis. And my third premise is that, apart from the UK, Japan stands to lose more from Brexit than any other country, certainly more than any other country in Northeast Asia, because of the importance of Japanese investment in the UK manufacturing sector. Although, as David Warren has pointed out, the deal that was eventually agreed between the UK and the EU is likely to be far less damaging to Japanese companies than perhaps they had once feared. Now, in the paper, I cite the argument of a Japanese scholar that in the immediate aftermath of the referendum, the likely impact or reaction of Japan was to stick even closer to the USA in its international relations with an uncertain world coming. And initially that was exactly what we saw then Prime Minister Abe doing. But one of the very first acts of Donald Trump on taking office was to withdraw the US from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement, which was a further 
drawback or disadvantage to, to Japan. But what we then seen, rather than Japan simply drawing even further in on itself, we've seen Japan taking the lead to revive the TPP as the new comprehensive and progressive agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP, again, as David said. But to much greater surprise, we've now seen the UK formally apply to join the CPTPP. And in the chapter, I examine the possible reasons behind all this. To be honest, from a UK perspective, it seems to make little sense and seems to be driven primarily by ideology, by an anti-EU sentiment rather than by pragmatism, because our trade with all the CPTPP members is small. In 2018, we sold more to Germany than to all the members of the CPTPP combined. We export more to Sweden alone than we do to Canada, which is our largest market in it. But Japan's also suggested that the EU-Japan free trade agreement a partnership agreement could be aligned with the CPTPP. And if this happens, it would then make far more sense for the UK also to be included. And an EU CPTPP agreement would create the world's largest free trade area, accounting for approximately 40% of global trade. And Japan would be at the heart of this. So this raises the question of Japan's motives. Is this purely about trade or are there also geostrategic considerations underlying this? Because neither China nor South Korea, nor for that matter Taiwan, are members of the CPTPP. Yet we see Japan's relations with China and Korea marked by strategic rivalry. At the time I wrote the paper, relations between Korea and Japan were perhaps the worst they've been in 70 years. So Japan might well see strategic advantage in a big new international trade agreement, which those two countries are not part of. And I argue in the chapter that while this might be attractive to Japan, actually both the EU's and UK's interests lie firmly in both South Korea and Taiwan. China's perhaps different, but South Korea and Taiwan also being members of the CPTPP partly because of their importance in trading terms for Europe and the UK, but also as countries that share the same values. In addition, it's very much in Europe's interest to support Taiwan against Chinese pressure. Now, there have been two very significant developments since the chapter was written. Firstly, of course, Donald Trump is no longer the US president. It's not yet clear whether Joe Biden will wish to have the US rejoin the CPTPP. If it does, that will obviously have a major impact. Whether or not it does, Joe Biden is also likely to be much more enthusiastic about the WTO than Donald Trump was. And we also now have a new head of the WTO. So we'll actually have to see if she's able to regalvanize the organization, because that would have an impact on the rise or otherwise of the CPTPP. But the basic premise remains valid. For the UK, joining the CPTPP is no substitute for membership of the single market. Both the EU and the UK should think strategically about membership of the CPTPP and seek to broaden its membership for their own mutual benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Michael.